across the fence, man's best friend takes center stage. We'll join a class where students are learning to understand canine communication. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The saying goes that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but don't tell that to an expert in canine behavior and communication at the University of Vermont. UVM's Animal Science Department offers a class on understanding and speaking dog. The class helps tackle big issues like preventing aggression or smaller tasks like teaching a dog to sit. For more, here's Across the Fences, Rebecca Gollin. Many college students will tell you that when learning a new language, it can be very helpful to practice with a native speaker. Hi. Oops. That's wow. your name, buddy. That's just what this class at UVM is doing. Except that in this classroom, the native speakers have four legs and are covered in fur. You can't just expect a dog to sit when you tell them to sit. It's like speaking in a foreign language. The class is called Understanding and Speaking Dog. Students are learning how to communicate with dogs in order to train them. Most people have opinions, thoughts, philosophies about dog training, and what I teach is science. It's fun. Good girl. Um, so remember, don't say the word. Jamie Shaw is a longtime dog trainer and adjunct instructor in the Department of Animal Science. She's teaching her students how to teach a dog to sit. It's not necessarily they understand the word, like sit means to actually sit down. It's, it's that they understand that's what you want from that, from that sound. So, so it's kind of, it's more like they understand that you want that rather than, oh, that's what that means. What we cover in the course is, this, much of it is the exact same thing you would learn in a basic level psychology course. And it's about reinforcement and you know, literally, how does training work? How can you work with the brain to accept and process information? What's the best way to do that? Shaw says that the key to success is to shape the dog's behavior in a series of small steps with plenty of rewards along the way. She recommends coming up with goals and developing a step-by-step -step training plan. The way that plan is implemented is called operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is a process where you choose a behavior that you would like a subject to know. So it could be with your roommate that you want to teach your roommate to pick up her dirty laundry instead of leaving it all over the house. Or it could be you want to teach your dog to sit when you ask it to sit instead of having it jump on visitors when they come to the house. You can't just take a dog and put it in the position that you want it to be in. Like if you're teaching a sit, you can't just take it and physically put it into a sit and do that a bunch of times and expect it to learn it as well. So what shaping is, is successive approximation. You're taking little baby steps towards the behavior. So every time it like puts its butt down a little bit more, you reward that and you use luring you have like a treat and you put it, kind of put it into the position that you want by making it want to be in that position with the treat in your hand. A double major in animal science and psychology, Katie Hayden is interested in dog training as a career. She's been practicing what she's learning at the local dog daycare where she works. One of the things that I really have loved in like the past six months or so that I've been like working with dogs professionally is I really love just seeing the improvement that they make and that is kind of what drives me on and so it's not so much, I mean it, it's a little surprising to see how much they can learn in such a short amount of time but it's really, that's what I love to see and that's what makes me love training dogs. What you need to do to get a dog that doesn't know how to sit or stand or whatever to do it. And Jamie especially it makes it look so easy. Her dogs are so well trained. So the, some of the ones that she brings in, no problem. We'll just sit on command. They'll just drop, lay down on the floor. And she makes it look so easy. And as we're learning tonight, it's a lot more difficult than it is than it looks. Shaw brings dogs to class throughout the semester in order to demonstrate certain habits and techniques. Most of the canine guest lecturers here this day are untrained rescue dogs from Random Rescue in Williamstown. 
frustration. At first, like I didn't realize how many steps you really have to do it. If you want them to do like a harder step, you have to like break it up into really, really small steps. Like if it's like a complicated trick, like how little, how small the steps are in order to reach it and how like if you if they're not getting it you have to change the whole plan or if they are getting it you don't want to do too much. You might get excited that they're getting it, you want to keep going, but you have to like stop and just let them take a break and pick it up again and just the repetition of it, doing the same trick over and over and over again until they master it. Good boy. And I back up when I train this because it makes the dogs run a little bit faster to you, makes it more fun. Teaching dogs some new tricks and learning some themselves, these UBM students are on their way to being fluent in the language of dog. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next segment this afternoon deals with a subject that dates to the Middle Ages. The first examples of taxidermy were found more than a thousand years ago, and taxidermy is still used and on display in museums around the world. Taxidermy is not for everyone, but it is part of Vermont's hunting heritage. Keith Silva tells us more. There's definitely the blood and guts part of it that is not noontime news type stuff. Rodney Elmer and his wife, Teresa, are used to being watched. In fact, it's how they measure success. They're taxidermists. I think he's good. He's got one eye that's a little sleepy on your side. If the eyes aren't correct, nothing else matters. That's the first thing people look at is the eyes. And that's what we look. When we look at everything we've done, we look at it in different angles to say, does it follow? Wait a second. The eyes are supposed to look like that? Isn't that what makes taxidermy kind of creepy in the first place? Well, that and hanging a dead animal on the wall. It really is weird, but to see a bobcat or see a deer and close up and touch it, that's awesome. For a non-hunter or an, a city person or somebody who's not exposed to the outdoors, it just brings life to them, and that's really what it does. There's a little bit of that, oh boy, it's looking at me thing. And then when they understand, well, it's just styrofoam, it's just leather with hair on the outside, and those are glass eyes. And then they look at how well you put it together. There's an instant appreciation for nature right away. The word taxidermy is taken from two Greek words, taxis, meaning arrangement, and derma, which refers to the skin. The majority of the hunting that takes place in Vermont occurs in the fall. At their shop in Northfield, the Elmers work year round, sewing, painting, and sometimes taking a blow dryer to creatures of all shapes and sizes. It's a gray squirrel and we're going to mount him in a sitting position. The Elmers see themselves not so much as artists, but as recreators and restorers. Rodney, like any craftsman, is quick to point out that quality only comes from quality. How the hunter treats his, uh, treats his animal beforehand will make a big difference to how good it comes out. Uh, you can't make a uh, nice furniture out of old rotten logs. Uh, same type of thing with this. It's only good because nature made it good and, and I can't make all of those beautiful hairs and all that those antlers and those things. People can't do that. Nature can do that and I'm just kind of putting it back together. It's a great job. Um, I love wildlife and the best thing to do is recreate what Mother Nature did. How, what, what better job can you have? You put the life back into something. Female taxidermists are rare. For Teresa, a seventh generation Vermonter, an avid outdoors woman, necessity was the mother of invention as more and more work kept coming in. It's a difficult profession to get into because it's dominated by men. Most of your customers are men. And there's preconceived notions that um, it's kind of gory, it's pretty gross in some sense, and women wouldn't do it. And again, we're back to a lot of women weren't hunting 20 years ago. That dynamics is definitely changing, but you've got to slowly do it. So it's, I have a lot of people doubt me that I can do this. They come in, I can show them a lot of things that they didn't expect, and the doubt goes. Take, for example, one of Teresa's signature pieces, a porcupine. There's a lot of difficulty in doing a porcupine because you can't touch it. It's like mounting a ship in a bottle. You know, it's a lot more skill in putting it together and not getting hurt, but also getting it anatomically correct. The quills are still in there, and 
it's just a unique thing to do and nobody expects anybody to do it. Call it macabre or majestic, creepy or curious, taxidermy is a practice of preservation, a true still life that recreates a moment and sustains a memory. When you look at something on the wall, it brings back all those elements and it, you relive it and it makes it real every time. So that's why they want it on the wall. You remember the story. You're not remembering the, the death of it, but you're remembering the story. And it's so individualized, that's why we love this job. I would say about half the people go out and purposely try and get their trophy so that they can get it mounted. And then the other half are out there and just happen to have a fantastic experience that they were elated about and wanted to turn that into a real, have a good keepsake of that fantastic time. We often refer to Vermont as a working landscape. That's true for those who work the land as well as for those who live off of it. Hunting is a tradition here in Vermont. It's part of our culture. There were 70,165 hunting licenses issued to Vermonters in 2009 by the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's 11% of the state's population. Animal populations are constantly shifting, and not because of hunting, but often because of development. By the way, the bird that I came across was unbelievably healthy. And Horse Farm is collaborating with the University of Minnesota on a study to determine the causes of equine metabolic syndrome. One of the principal means of, of affecting changes in habitat is by manipulating the vegetation. Really the whole basis of coverts was to first of all make people aware of how easy they can affect these changes during the course of uh, a regular timber harvest. But number two, we wanted to have a lay group of experts in this uh, subject matter that are willing to spend time, at least a year, uh, working in their communities to spread the message to other people who own forest lands. And really, that's a big part of it. A well-managed woodland will safeguard animals, but wildlife don't recognize boundary lines, only habitat. Not so good for the birds and the animals. Ain't that a beauty. Hunters, on the other hand. So what's Teresa think about that? It was a great day. All it right. Was really cool. You know, if you asked a hunter and you press the hunter on what he or she is looking for, um, I think it comes right down to a high quality experience, uh, even more so than being able to harvest an animal. They would love to have a day uh, where they can sit and watch three or four animals walk by them and not have to shoot uh, simply because it's not the animal they want to take. Uh, at least I choose to think that way. Uh, you know, when you make improvements that, um, uh, that allow uh, turkey to be far more productive uh, in terms of fledging their young on your land, uh, those birds are going to wander far and wide and may end up on, on land that uh, has not been improved. Uh, and it may be the place where people end up taking birds uh, during the hunting season. They may get the mistaken impression that they took the bird there because it is improved habitat when in fact it isn't. The thing that really sort of allowed that bird to exist and to be healthy is really kind of a mile down the road uh, where the guy improved his or her forest uh, for, for turkey and other species. We want to be connected to the outdoors and to be a part of all of it. For non-sportsmen, taxidermy will always remain on the margins. For hunters, it's only a matter of time before someone decides to pick up a needle and thread and give it a try for themselves. Something Elmer encourages. I think you need to have a little bit of uh, handyman skills. Uh, if you can use duct tape and staples pretty good and fix things together, it, it makes it pretty easy to, to, to want to try it. A lot of it's trial and error. You learn as you go. Uh, some things really come easy and some you got to work at. And it's not really rocket science, but it is a lot of fun, it is artistic, and it's definitely something uh, that if anybody wanted to try, they should give it a try. And for all the would-be taxidermists out there, if it feels like you're being watched, you're probably doing a good job. In Northfield, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. In case you're wondering, the cost of taxidermy can range from a few hundred dollars to several thousand dollars, depending on the type of mount that a customer is seeking. 
That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.